uh, Rachel Reeves went over to the United States uh, uh, to some sort of media fanfare about how she wants to bring in um, Bidenomics. Now, I'm just going to um, go through some of the uh, stuff on, on this in the media. This is The Guardian. Um, Martin Kettle, pay attention to Rachel, Rachel Reeves. Her economic thinking is a return to sanity. The Shadow Chancellor has a vision for social democracy in an age of economic shocks and uncertainty. New Labour, this isn't. And he says, at the heart of the Shadow Chancellor's argument are four core principles. The first is that the rules of the economy have changed because of repeated shocks since 2008. The second is that government has to be more proactive in order to establish the economic order that is so conspicuously under threat from the, those shocks. The third is that liberal economies must work together to do this, not against one another. And the fourth is that all this must happen within effective national fiscal rules and not by allowing debt to balloon. The Financial Times um, reports the Green Prosperity Plan is Labour's version of US President Joe Biden's $369 billion Inflation Reduction Act, a vast programme of subsidies and tax breaks. Reeves said it would be at the heart of our modern industrial strategy. But Reeves has also committed to cut public debt as a share of gross domestic product over five years, meaning she could be forced to reduce their $140 billion five-year green programme if the public finances were tight. She said the rules were paramount, adding fiscal discipline is really important. Reeves said it was vital to control day-to-day -day government spending to create room for strategic investment in new industries and green energy technology that she, and that she would exert tight control. Colleagues will tell you that Rachel knows how to say no, she added. Uh, this is um, a couple of interviews with Rachel Reeves on this, and then I'll, I'll get on to you, Prem. Sorry to everyone for, for putting you through this. The Inflation Reduction Act yeah. is encouraging investment in the US. And I hear that all the time from businesses in Britain that there's this real pull factor today because of what the US government is doing and how they're prioritizing that investment. Securonomics is an approach that builds on the contributions of more people in more parts of Britain and with a, a more secure national economy, uh, taking advantage of some of the big opportunities, but also ensuring our resilience, our strength and our security to give families that security that they are desperately crave right now. I'm still not sure what it is, Prem. Um, can <laughs> Can you help me? What what is uh, what is Bidenomics? Well, Bidenomics is built around, as you mentioned, about this five hundred billion pound Inflation Reduction Act, and what it is at the heart of it is the promise of more subsidies and tax perks for corporations and the rich. It reaffirms faith in trickle down economics. And uh, it is offering all those kind of perks and subsidies to, as it were, promote clean energy and the creation of what it says are new jobs. Now, it does not really alter fundamental sort of near neoliberal approach to uh, management of society and economy. Neoliberalism isn't consigned to any graveyard it is just been kind of revarnished and represented a labor's version few days after rachel reeves gave those interviews was included in a 33 page report the title is a new business model for britain now i find the title incredibly intriguing it doesn't have anything to do with society it is just a new business model and uh, when you read the paper, and I recommend people to read it, what it says is Labour is willing and uh, able and willing to serve the interests of corporations and the rich. And in that process, some crumbs may be thrown to the masses if necessary. That is a central message of that 33 page uh, document. Now, whether it is Bidenomics or the UK equivalent, as you heard Rachel Reeves that use another a kind of a slogan, securonomics. One wonders what on earth that securonomics is. So when you read the pamphlet, few things jump at you. 
It says Labour Labour says that its approach relies on productivism. Uh, there's another slogan for you, asking both the public and private sector to boost productive capacity. And then it says it would be making and shaping markets that are essential to the nation's resilience and future prosperity. Now, of course, on the face of it, you may find that there's little to disagree with, but you scratch the surface, there is virtually no detail. For example, uh, Labour says uh, Labour call uh, talks about productivism, which depends on investment. But capitalists have been on investment strike in the UK since the 1990s. Tax perks subsidies have not incentivized investment. Higher wages and disposable incomes can increase people's uh, purchasing power and thereby encourage more investment because people will have capacity to buy things. On that, Labour is proposing next to actually nothing. Uh, the bloated and scandal-ridden city of London is the least productive part of the UK economy. Speculators make huge profits, but produce little of any values. Yet Labour's productivism has no plans to shackle, uh, shackle the city of London at all. Short-termism is strangling the UK economy, but, and that means you've got to put herbs on the powers of speculators and shareholders. There's nothing in the Labour paper to explain how exactly you do, you do that. Then Labour also, the document also adds, it says, we must, and I quote, we must also recognise that investment decisions are a function of corporate governance structures. When I read that, my heart soared and I thought, ah, they're going to be promoting a stakeholder economy and ending the shareholder-centric model of corporate governance. Nope, none of that. And this Labour will certainly not bring uh, privatised monopolies such as water uh, and many others under public ownership. So it talks about a public-private partnership, which is something we heard in Blair days, which continued with privatisation and left us with a disastrous PFI. That uh, certainly, you know, is well, Labour's not going to reverse that. When I read the pamphlet a bit further, it says it will adopt the US style, and I quote, modern supply side economics. Now, whenever I hear about supply side economics, I worry because that is really a code word for deregulation. So, what exactly is it going to deregulate? Labor, food, environmental, and other standards, more curbs on trade unions. A little while later, it says uh, that labor will give trade trade labor will uh, will be giving trade unions greater freedom to organize. Well, but it is not committed to repealing the Tory anti-union laws, which is what I wanted to see a commitment to. Labor says also in the monograph, we will equip British workers with the skills they need to thrive and remove barriers that stop them from contributing today. And in the same breath, Starmer last week or week before said, we will continue with university tuition fees. Now, you can see that there is no real uh, substance. University tuition fee means many young people are burdened with debt for the rest of their life. And paradoxically, graduates from poor families pay more because their loans are, are over a longer period. They pay mo more to get higher education, university education than the richer ones. So it is going to continue with that. And more killing things in the pamphlet. Uh, and you hinted at that. Labour said, under it, public debt will fall as a share of GDP. And that day-to-day -day spending must be sustainably funded. Uh, that means austerity will continue. There will be no real pay rises for public sector workers or increase in real investment in public services. Taxes. Uh, Labour promises, quote, fair and efficient taxes. Well, what does that mean? Labour continues uh, to go on about ending the non-DOM tax status. Actually, that is also... Um, something they can't do. Imagine somebody comes to work temporarily in the UK for a year or two. What are you going to do? You're going to force them to pay their taxes on their worldwide income in the UK? You're not. Some version of non-DOM status will continue. You can't permanently abolish it. 
And Labour said it's going to raise about three billion pounds. When I worked with Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, our estimate was about one billion pound because what we did, we also deflated all the estimates by more than 50% because you don't know how people are going to behave. Okay, so we took the behavioral aspects into account. Uh, Labour now is not doing that. So here's the kind of thing Labour will continue with. Capital gains will continue to be taxed at lower rates than wages and salaries. Oh, that is grossly unfair. That is what Labour is going to continue. No rise in corporation tax. No 50% ban for, uh, uh, of income tax for the rich. More tax perks for corporations and the rich. This year, uh, UK government has handed £40 uh, million pounds of subsidies to Shell which has been swimming in cash. So Labour will continue with these kind of uh, policies. Paupers and millionaires pay VAT at the same rate, which is uh, 20%, which forms takes a greater proportion of the poor people's income. Labour will actually continue with that. So it just does not make any sense. Can I just give one final illustration, Crispin, fairly quickly? It's sure. about the housing crisis. Uh, Labour's promise to increase home ownership now, how on earth do you actually do that? Uh, average salary in the UK is £33,000, though there are lots of regional variations. Average home price is 282000 That means nine times the salary. How can people service that? If you want to increase home ownership, you need to increase workers' share of GDP, and that necessarily means reducing the capital's share of GDP. Now, I, I, I'm not aware of a single commitment, policy detail, which is going to do that. We have a backlog of 4.3 million houses. How are they going to be built? So brick, brick, brick production in the UK has halved since 2008. 25% of all construction materials are imported. So what are the supply chain constraints? Can the Labour Party or anybody else actually tell us? Suppose we build more houses, millions of them. How are we going to reduce the actual price of the house? And if we do, what about the people who are stuck uh, with negative equity? What would be the consequences for them? In other words, any policy has to pay attention to these details. And we did that when I worked with Corbyn and John McDonald. We, you know, we looked at all the details before coming up with a manifesto. We did not come up with any sort of glib statements, yeah. you know, popular sort of apple pie and motherhood kind of statements. We looked at details. I see no details in this paper. And it is really harking back to the kind of policies of new labor, somewhat tweaks, and basically trying to be everything to everybody. And it can't. It has to decide which side it is on. And on this document labor has produced, I don't think it is on the side of the working people. Uh, thank you so much for that clarification, um, Frame. It, I mean, I suspected the whole presentation was more than the, the, the actual, you know, the meat of what she was saying. There was not much to it. It seemed a lot of about presentation and, and going to America and looking. And she even had a tweet that she got wrong where she showed her, her ticket was a, a really expensive ticket and she had to delete the tweet. I mean, the whole thing was all about PR. Um, and uh, you, you've shown it, you've exposed it. I think they're relying on people not knowing what what's going on, really. So we have to get your um, your comments out there um, to a bigger audience. And thank you again for coming on. It's great to see you. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye.